Welcome. I know everyone's got to squeeze in a little bit, so get to know your neighbor, share some stories, whatnot. And, uh, and welcome to the very first session at VMworld 2016 in Las Vegas. So, cool times. Yeah, exciting. <laughs> Why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so first off, this is a disclaimer. I've, I've never read it. You're supposed to. Cool. All right. Yeah. Uh, we'll just go through some quick introductions because we have a lot of content. And just to baseline really quick, the idea with this session is you've heard of PowerShell, you've heard of PowerCLI, you've not really dug into it yet, you want to you know, understand it a little bit. So if you're already kind of writing code at the PowerShell level, this may be a little more introductory than you may care for. Uh, but the idea is to help usher you into this world and give you some actual code examples. We've got a demo laptop up here, and we're going to write code live uh, for you. We also have a microphone right up here. So at any time, if you have a question, want to come up and just queue up, we'll pause and, and take your question. Or if you yell it out there, we'll try to repeat it for everybody so that the audience can hear it. Does that sound fair? Cool. Wow, man, that was a lame yes. I mean, oh. Does that sound cool? Yeah. <laughs> there right. we go. Much go more ahead. excitement. Go ahead, Kyle. Who are you? All right, so I'm Kyle Ruddy. I'm the senior technical marketing engineer at VMware. I cover the APIs, CLIs, SDKs. Uh, so that includes Power CLI, ESX CLI, things of that nature. Uh, I blog, my personal blog is thatcouldbeaproblem.com. Uh, I'm also on GitHub under the username KM Ruddy, so you can see some of the scripts that I've created out there. I'm also one of the hosts for the V Brown Bag group. Great resource there. And I'm also on Twitter at KM Ruddy as well. Is your photo of you speaking at a. That's very meta. Isn't You're it like though? speaking at a VMworld it's, in your VMworld slide. That's right. VMworld. That's how cool. I use it. Well, welcome, Kyle. It's a cool dude. Uh, this is me. I'm Chris Wall. There's all my stuff. I think the most important thing you could ever take away from my biography is that I love to play Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder specifically. So if anyone's a 3.5 or 3.75 nerd, right on, paper and pencil forever. Uh, <laughs> and I put the PowerShell MVP thing up there, but that doesn't really mean that I know everything about PowerShell. That guy sitting right there, his name is Luke Deakins. Uh, but it does mean that I really love PowerShell, and I've been writing code uh, using some form of it since uh, about 2009 or so. So really been a fan of the framework for a very long time. So this is what we're going to cover, five basic things. We're going to start off with the basics of PowerShell and PowerCLI, because there's a lot of confusion about what they are and how they interact with one another. Then we're going to go into what I call the lingo dictionary, because like any technology, there's buzzwords and, and marketing words and, and you know kind of names of things that are specific to a technology or a sphere of influence within a technology. Uh, we'll talk about how to set up and configure your environment to run both PowerShell, which is a little more complex these days than it used to be, and PowerCLI, which is becoming less complex than it used to be. So good job to, he works at VMware, so he has like the official statement. I just have opinions. Um, we'll talk about how to start writing some code. And there's a cool phone ringtone there, I like it. Uh, and writing some logic statements, which I think is the next step after you start learning the syntax within PowerShell. Okay. So that's what we'll start with. The first thing is, what is PowerShell and PowerCLI? And, and a lot of times, these things, I feel, are treated as unique entities. People think that there's PowerCLI is a thing, and PowerShell is a thing, and that they don't really cross over. And the reality is, PowerShell is a framework. It's a really awesome framework. I actually pulled the specific wiki definition in here because I thought they did a good job. And I've specifically highlighted in blue kind of the, the important piece. It's task automation, configuration management framework. And it's a scripting language. Because for a long time, Windows had no real scripting language. You had to borrow basic as an example, or JavaScript, or batch scripts, or something like that. And bash was always this much better alternative that was not object-oriented, but it was available on Linux just natively. Right? So Windows kind of sucked the script on. Anyone disagree that Windows sucked the script on before PowerShell? Uh, like a couple hands on? You just hate oh, Windows? Yeah. That's, that's, that's not all right. really enough hands. PowerShell's on Linux now, too, so you can just hate that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I was amazed when, when, the, when the release came for open sourcing PowerShell. I, I uh, promoted someone's blog that shows you how to install it on the Mac. And uh, I've never seen so many F words in response to that. <laughs> I was like, you could just not install it. That's also an option. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, so uh, kind of the, the, the other twist on that is uh, really it's, it's a great way to get started with automation. There's a lot of domain-specific language implementations out there, DSLs with Puppet and Chef and things like that, and, and DSC, the desired state configuration. Um, 
which uh, Luke has a great session on vSphere DSC. But those are other ways to do, to slice and dice things. But I think PowerShell is, is very plain English. When I work with folks that are getting invested in the PowerShell, they say, it's not really a hard syntax. Like, my worst programming language I ever had to learn was COBOL. I really hated that because if you put the period in the wrong place, the whole thing doesn't compile. Uh, and now, uh, the alpha builds are available on GitHub for uh, Linux and Mac OS. Whether or not you like that or not, it's, it's there. Uh, the last thing I'm going to harp on for PowerShell, and then I'll have, hand it off to Kyle about PowerCLI, is that I think the most powerful thing is that it's modular and object-oriented. You're not just taking strings of text and serializing or deserializing them and having to kind of scrape through them to find the information that you need. You're actually working with objects. You know, .NET Core under the covers and a lot of implementations is what's the fuel driving this. But it gives you this great clean command structure that you can use in a shell for PowerShell. So it's a great way to get started with scripting. And the modules and the sunset that is snap-ins are a great, a great way to make the code portable between environments. So it's, it's very flexible. Now, Kyle, what's, what's all the PowerCLI about? Yeah, so PowerCLI is the build-on to PowerShell. So this is VMware's uh, introduction and integration with PowerShell itself. Uh, so right now, there's over 500 commandlets that you can use and call by way of PowerCLI. I think actually the, the current number is about 528. So it, it's, uh, and that spreads across multiple, uh, multiple tiers of, of VMware's product line. So that's your vSphere, that's your Horizon, uh, vCloud. Uh, yeah, so it's, it, it's very nice. However, there's also some things out there that, that are also integrating that's coming from the community. There's things like the, the Power NSX modules. There's also uh, Power VRA modules as well. Uh, and we've also been recognized as one of the most robust uh, integrations with PowerShell. So much, in fact, that when, they, when Microsoft did the announcement of, of, you know, hey, PowerShell is coming to, to Linux and Mac OS, we were one of the featured companies that, uh, to integrate with them right off the bat on day one. Yeah, he's being kind of humble. I think VMware really drove a lot of PowerShell adoption for, for administrators running vSphere environments. Uh, the VI toolkit was the predecessor of that, and then it became you know, the PowerCLI module, or snap-ins, and now module. Okay, so that's a little bit of the history lesson. I know it's a little bit dry. I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, I think now it's, it's more about the lingo and what we're talking about. We've mentioned modules and snap-ins and things like that. So, you know, what are those things? And I, I've tried to, we can go really crazy tech deep, you know, into these things, but I wanted to start at kind of a higher level. What is a module? So this is like the basic way of thinking of a module. And it's a set of functions and code and, and bits and pieces of descriptor files and things like that that go into a folder that you can port between one system to the next. You can develop a module on your system. You can put it out there. Someone else can drop that into any one of these locations. Uh, basically, the modules folder within the Windows PowerShell folder that's uh, the parent of that. And you get all that code. And the really neat thing about modules is once the code's in there and you have these path variables in your environmental variables, the uh, PowerShell path uh, are set like this, and you put a, a folder in there, it'll automatically start reading for those. So if you start typing a commandlet that you haven't loaded, you haven't loaded the module for that yet, it'll say, oh, you need this particular commandlet, let me go ahead and load that module for you, which is a really big advantage over things like snap-ins. So here's an example. I just pulled up my OneDrive, which is where I store my modules, because I'm lazy and I want it to port across all my devices. And I have it in Documents, Windows, PowerShell, and there's a modules folder in there. So it really, literally just drop the file in there. There's no install, uh, which is great because, well, I'll, I'll tell you how horrible snap-ins are in a moment. Uh, these are some things you need to write a module, right? And this, I'm starting at kind of the grand scheme of things. I don't expect you to start with modules, but you'll be installing modules from folks first, and I think it's good to understand just what the heck those things are. Um, but the idea is there's a PSD1 extension that I'll show you in a minute that describes all the, you know, the functionality that's going to be exported from this module. It tells, essentially, PowerShell what's inside of this thing. And then from there, it also describes how the module was constructed. You know, who built it? What's their name? Who do you blame if it breaks and blows up your entire environment? That's important. You want, you want the blame thing there. Uh, desired state config resources are now provided in a module manifest. And PowerShell gallery data, which is like apt-get and yum for Windows now. It actually uses NuGet under the covers. So you can do an install module, whatever. And it'll pull it off the web from the repository of your choice. This is just an example of a module that I've written. And you can see functions to export. I'm basically telling it, hey, when someone drops this folder in here, here's all the functions that we'll provide. Here's who to blame. There's some tags and things like that. So it's just a file written in PowerShell. To sum it up, it's essentially this. <laughs> it's the less technical version of it. So Kyle, what's a snap-in? Oh, snap-ins. All snap. Uh, yeah, literally, literally all snap. Yeah. So they're they're written in .NET. They're compiled. 
Uh, you know, they're available as an assembly. Uh, if you've been using PowerCLI for a while, you know that that's one of the things that we use, a, uh, it, which we're trying to get away from. We're, as you see, PowerCLI evolving, and you go through and you look at some of the underlying uh, features, you're noticing that there's less and less snap-ins, more modules, uh, because really they're, they're painful. They, they involve the registry. It's, you know, it, even Microsoft is starting to move away from them. Yeah, my opinion is they suck, so don't use them. If, like, don't build one for sure, unless you just hate everybody, including yourself. <laughs> uh, I would try to avoid them, but, but they're, they're kind of dying off, thank goodness. And that, that auto-load functionality I was talking about doesn't work with snap-in world. And anything that touches the registry, I don't want it. I want it to be very lightweight. Uh, so that's modules and snap-ins. They contain a bunch of code. But what is that code? Well, really, it's functions primarily that are in there. You know, not so much in the snap-in world, but definitely in the module world. We're writing functions. And function is just saying, I'm going to take, accept any number of inputs. I'm going to declare what the inputs are. I'm going to do some work against those inputs, and I'm going to provide outputs. Right? So I've got it here uh, that it allows you to list something by name. You can actually make a commandlet out of that with a function. Uh, you can call it like, I love, any, anyone who knows me knows that I love SpongeBob, the cartoon. Yeah. Pineapple under the sea. So you might run, you might make a function called your pants, because maybe that's what you do at work. I don't know. Uh, and you can either put it into a module and, and declare in that module, hey, this function exists, go ahead and make it available. Or you can do what's called dot sourcing a function, which is essentially you put a period, a space, and then the path to that particular function. You run that, and then it's loaded, and you can start running the function just by its name in the future. So that's kind of what's going on when you declare it within the module. But this is good if you're just writing some code, and you want to say, all right, I've made some modifications to this function. Let me dot source it, which loads it into the session. And then you can try it out if you make some changes there. And to peek under the covers a little bit, that's probably hard to read. But uh, essentially, there's some description stuff at the header of a function to help people out. This is optional, but not optional. Right? The code's not going to yell at you if you don't put it in there. But try giving something like this to anyone else. Like If you're just writing for yourself, you can get away with it. But this is telling you things like, what are the inputs that I accept? What, what format should the inputs be in? What are the outputs? What's the description? Again, who's the author? Who's to blame? That kind of stuff. And some examples so they know how to run your code. Because the rest of it's all just, here's some parameters. Begin by doing this stuff one time. Do the process stuff however many times I need to. You can loop through it, whatnot. And then at the end, do this other stuff. Does it look pretty simple? Like, it's just do stuff in this order and then spit out a, a return. Right? Not too hard. Cool. Is everybody just drinking it in, or is it like, ugh, this is hard to read, you can't, the PowerShell. OK. And then uh, scripting is the last thing. That's, I'm not writing a function. I'm literally just li writing lines of code and executing them. There's no real format to it. This is where I think you're going to start. You're going to start writing some scripts. It can be one-liners, two-liners, whatever that is. And this is where you can just really kick the tires uh, with doing basic administration, doing getting some data. I put a recommendation there, focused on writing functions. But start learning some code with a script, and then you can start putting that into a function. Does that sound fair? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to start small. You have to start with something that you're comfortable with, and then you grow into something that's maybe a little more advanced and uh, take it from there. Yeah, and then you can name it like awesome.ps1, and no one knows what that does. So that's not fun either. <laughs> cool. So the last thing I want to talk about before we get to the demo is just uh, some tips for setting up and configuring your environment. Uh, the first one is setting up PowerShell itself. Now, PowerShell for a very long time has been native to the operating system. You don't have to install PowerShell as of, I think, Windows 8 and Server 2008 R2, something like that. Um, but they're not going to come with the latest and greatest unless you're running Windows 10 or Windows 2016, something like that. Uh, I advise go ahead and upgrading to Windows PowerShell version 5. whatever, 5.0 or greater. Because there's a, a lot of functionality that was added in 5. Now, 4, 3 and 4 added some cool things, but 5 was almost, it felt like almost like a revamp of the entire framework. So if you want to do anything with uh, the PowerShell gallery and things like that, you're going to need version 5. And to do that, you go and grab uh, the Windows Management Framework version 5, whatever the latest is. And I pointed out this picture because uh, the first couple times I had trouble figuring out what file to download because, you know, they start with like Windows 7 and Windows 8, and I'm like, well, I'm running a server. I need server stuff. But now it says Windows 8.1 and W2K12 R2. It's a horrible naming structure. But obviously, look deep into the file name to grab the one you need. And they're in MSIs. You install it. You're, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so once you have that installed, I don't expect you to memorize this link. But if you just Google Windows Management Framework 5.0, it's going to give you the latest link. And this one's probably old now anyways. 
Once you have that, the other thing I recommend doing to make your life easier is use an integrated scripting environment like the PowerShell ISE, or ICE, as some people call it. Uh, it's, it's much more robust than like a Notepad, or even in my opinion, I'm not a huge fan of like Sublime Text and Notepad++ for PowerShell, because I like IntelliSense, and I like the profile capabilities that come with ICE. Right, so if you're a, a Power GUI user from the old, uh, was it Dell? Dell, Dell no. put that out, and they, they bought it from whoever it was, Quest, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that thing's kind of long in the tooth. I recommend just using the ICE, which is installed natively on the operating system, and you're good to go. Uh, the one thing that you can do, though, is you can build a profile. There's actually three different ways you can build a profile. Uh, the console, which is the blue PowerShell screen. ICE, which is the kind of graphical editor. It's the integrated scripting environment, so you can write and run code and kind of see the variables. Or just both. And both is what I do, just that profile.ps1. You can put it at any one of these locations. I just put it in my current user location, and I usually put something like that in my OneDrive so it just floats with me. Or if you have Dropbox or you know, whatever it is, Google Drive, uh, you can put it in these locations. And then uh, you can actually write a little script in your, in your profile.ps1 because it's just a PowerShell script that gets run whenever you load either the console or the, profile, or the ICE. And what I do is I, I make it easier for myself to write code on my workstation. The first thing I do is I set execution policy to bypass, which is a huge no-no in production. Don't do that outside of like your laptop. It's really just, I'm writing code, I haven't signed it yet, and I don't want to deal with that headache. Now what that's going to let you do is allow you to run unsigned code that's on your laptop. You don't have to you know, sign it with a certificate or anything like that. Uh, so that's handy just for developing. Uh, I also set my location to Dropbox slash code. That's where I write my code so that it's always synchronized across my devices so that I can pick up a tablet and start writing code in the laptop and go to the desktop. So that's, that's just laziness. You'll notice that's a, a theme with me. Uh, and then this, this logic statement, if PSISC, this is really a poor man's way of saying, did I load the console or did I load ICE? Right? If this variable exists, I know that I am actually running the ISE and that I want to do a few more things. Because I love this program. Uh, it's, this, it's this great extension called uh, ISC Steroids. Uh, definitely recommend getting that. It'll help you write really great code. It's kind of like training wheels for, for newbies on PowerShell. I clear the host, which just says clear the screen. And then I write beast mode with a guy flipping a table. Because nothing pumps me up more. Look at that. It even says beast mode act is like rah, ready to write some PowerShell. <laughs> I mean, you gotta, you gotta do these little things. So that's PowerShell. Let's talk about PowerCLI, how to get that installed and running. All right, so to, to start off with PowerCLI, you can go to the, the shortened URL by vmware.com slash go slash PowerCLI. There's a download link uh, that'll take you directly to it. Uh, yes, you will have to log into my.vmware.com to, to actually access it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we. we've I can heard, say those things. Yes, he, yeah. He's like the, the, the little guy on my shoulder that's giving me all the bad information. Uh, but, you know, we've heard the feedback. There, there are things that are being worked on as far as that. Uh, so hopefully we're working to resolve that. But that is how you download it today. Uh, and as far as once you get started with PowerCLI, some of the things that we recommend is being on PowerShell version 5. Uh, however, really, three is the the lowest recommend or lowest version uh, that's supported. Uh, always go to the newest version of PowerCLI. Uh, I recently wrote a blog article about this, just trying to show that you know it works. It's fully backward compatible to any version of vSphere that's that's still supported. So PowerCLI 6.3 R1 is the current version. It goes all the way back to 5.0, and that's not saying that it wouldn't work against you know, 4.x systems or whatnot, but, uh, you know, it goes back to the supported ones. Uh, and definitely you want to have the prereq of .NET Framework 4.5. Uh, however, you know, if you run into any issues straight off the bat, once you install PowerCLI, which, yes, it is an installer. I'm um, not going to do the no, boo two no, times. No, not, not that I don't want to jump okay. the shark. Okay. Uh, you, but if you run into any issues right off the bat, run your Windows updates, because that's normally what's going to fix the issue. Yay.net. All right, so getting into actually how you install it, you download it, you execute it, and then, uh, so even if you're upgrading, it's the same process. So the difference between just installing it for the first time and doing an upgrade is that during the upgrade process, it'll prompt you and say, hey, we've noticed that you've already got a version of this out there. Would you like to upgrade? Everything else is the same. Uh, so, again, clicking next, clicking next, clicking next, and then clicking finish. Uh, however, you do have the option to go through some of the custom setup. So if you know that you're not going to be messing around with vCloud, you know, you don't have to install those modules. 
Simple as that. You can also change where it's actually uh, installed to what destination folder. Uh, and then hopefully everything goes okay. You get this install shield wizard has completed. Yay. <laughs> and at that point, you are greeted with some shortcuts that are on your desktop. So you're going to either have the uh, PowerCLI shortcut plus the PowerCLI 32-bit uh, version. It's more for guest customizations. Uh, it's pretty and good about warning you when you need a 30, when you need to run 32-bit mode. It, yeah, it'll say I can't run this without 32-bit mode. You just find the shortcut for PowerCLI 32-bit mode. Yep. Uh, and then you also have the option to go ahead and run the initialization script. So if you just open up the Power, uh, PowerShell window and run the initialization script, it's the same thing as running the shortcut. Uh, you can go either way. It's kind of a personal preference thing. We do have a question. Yes. Yes, yes, it will be available as a PDF afterwards. Um, and then since we have Luke here, there's also uh, his version of, uh, what is it, the, the auto loader. Yep, Luke D wrote an auto loader, which goes through and removes all of the headache of this. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's a pretty nice feature. Yay. So also check that out. We're big on community stuff. So, you know, we fully embrace the community. We've got a script repo that's out there that we're, that we're working with the community on to publish stuff. Uh, so a couple of flings that we also offer, we have Power Actions, which Power Actions is a fling that you install and it works with your vCenter server. And what it does is it allows you to run Power CLI scripts directly from the vCenter. So that's a pretty cool option. There's also the Onyx client. And Onyx, what happens is that you sign in through the Onyx client, which interfaces with the vSphere uh, the vCenter server, and it actually has another console window that will spit out the code as you're going through and clicking through uh, through your GUI session. Uh, so that's an extremely helpful thing. One, you know, when you're getting started and, and trying to figure out really what you're, uh, you know, trying to replicate that in your automated processes. Big time. Yeah, it's nice to it's nice to click through the GUI and it tells you like do this. It, you remember uh, using like an Exchange in installer 2007 Beyond? It would tell you the PowerShell code as you did it. To me, it's kind of like that. And it's like here's what I'm doing. So cool. All right. No more slides ish. I have some as backup slides because I know not everyone gets to be here. But we're gonna start. We're gonna talk about starting to code and working with PowerShell code. Cool. Everybody good so far? Did you have your coffee before or you're waiting till after? All right. And again, just queue up if you have questions or raise your hand or if you hate what I'm coding and you think it's horribly wrong, you can just leave. So, <laughs> or, or you can challenge it, whichever. <laughs> cool. So the first thing I want to talk about, let me, let me switch over to the demo here. Let's see if that works. Hey, cool. I just have some, some reminders of myself. Is, is the difference between uh, what I call safe and unsafe commandlets? It's not what I call it. It's the industry term. Because I think the biggest challenge when you start to work with code is, or at least the thing I hear the most is, well, what if I f up and blow up the data center? Right? Is that is that a concern? You know, you worry about like blowing everything up, writing the wrong string or something like that. And it's it's a valid concern. So, if you're in more of the programming world or the development world, we have uh, safe and unsafe commandlets. And that's it sounds a little more extreme than it is. Safe just means when I run this command, I'm going to retrieve data and nothing's actually going to be harmed. You know. So I have a couple examples here. These are safe commandlets. Um, like here, it says git vm host has some data. Let me make that a little bit bigger. Boom, there we go. Uh, so git is a very good one to start using. If you just want to say, OK, what happens if I get data about a vm host? You know, what that's, what's that going to come back with? And it's just telling me, OK, cool. You asked me to get information on a vSphere host. Uh, you asked me specifically for, in my case, it's my rubric lab back in Santa Clara. So it's like, OK, host number six. Here's what I know about it. And the interesting thing about commandlets is they can spit out whatever they want. And so when we start working with functions or commandlets that call for information and retrieve it, you may think that that's all you get. You know, what, what do we have here? Name, connection state, power, CPU, things like that. But that's just what it's returning. And there's two important things about this. Number one, these are objects coming back that are being displayed as text on your screen. You don't have to, like, count the spaces or tab over three times or anything like that. If you're used to serializing text data with something like bash, it's totally different. What it's actually doing is the second important thing. It's pulling back all the objects that it's aware of, all the information and items for this particular object and saying, I'm going to display maybe six of them on your screen, but there's a ton more kind of hidden behind the covers. Right? And you can, you can actually look at that by passing another command. If I just add a uh, pipe, 
which is how we say we want to take one object and then use that as an input for another object. I can do a format list here. I'll actually type it all, all the way out. So I can say, grab that information, pull all those objects, and then display it on my screen as a list. So I can see all the data that's in there. And it's hard to display that much data on there, but it's going to pull back after it comes over the Wi-Fi down to Santa Clara. All the information it knows about this host. In fact, let me see if I can just make this a little bit bigger here. Unlock console pane. There we go. Just to make that a bit bigger for you. So you can see there's actually a ton of objects being returned with what's called a key value pair. So on the left side, we have the keys. It's basically this holds information. The key is called version or time zone or license key, something like that. And then the return on the other side is the value. That's the actual value of that particular piece of information. And you can scroll through all these little pieces and do things with it. It's actual objects. So we have one here, power state. I can actually look up and see what that is. If I go back to the code here and say, cool, I want the power state, I can actually wrap this around Oops. and say, give me the power state information. And it's come back and say, well, it's powered on. Right? Because I'm asking for an object from the information that I got. Does that make sense? I'm saying, get all the data, but I want this one key and return that as an object. Right? In and of itself, that doesn't do anything. It's, I mean, maybe you just want to run this to see that it's powered on. But the fact that you can pipe that and move that information elsewhere is very powerful. So and I apologize if the tabbing between screens is causing motion sickness. I had that as a feedback once. Like, you, you change screens too fast, so I'll alt tab slower. There we go. <laughs> Hopefully we're good. So give that feedback. It's always good. I, I do what I can. As another example, maybe I want to get all of the information on my cluster, and the name of that is demo. And again, it's going and grabbing all the data, all the objects that it knows about this vSphere cluster named demo, and it's spitting out you know, four or five of them on the screen. But we can play with all of that. We can actually get all the data that we want out of it. And we can do that as a format list. I'm just using the shorthand there and say, cool, give me everything you know. It just spits out a gob of information. So it's all there, right? So those are all safe. It's not possible to use a safe commandlet and harm data, right? Otherwise, it's not a safe commandlet. So you can run these to your heart's content. The only way I could possibly see where you'd screw something up is if you had 900,000 virtual machines or something like that, and you just did a massive git against all of them, paralyzed across a bunch. I mean, you could potentially bottleneck the server or something, but you're not going to harm the data. You know, the, the, the actual data that you're re requesting is not going to be modified. Does that make sense? Cool. So those are safe commandlets. I just want to point those out. And then we have unsafe commandlets. I've got things like here, like set virtual machine, set dash VM. And the idea here is I know about a piece of data. Maybe I got some information firsthand, and now I want to do something with that. I want to modify the data. So set VM, I've got a couple examples. I'll have to make it a little bit smaller so you can see all of it. There you go. I'm basically saying three different things here. Let me, let me actually break these out into different examples. There we go. So the first example here is saying, I want to set VM. I want to set the DRS automation level specifically for my virtual machine, because I don't want to screw up anybody else's virtual machine, to disabled. You probably want to make sure that there's some kind of check in place, or you just want to see what's going on. That's where what if, do you see that what if parameter at the end here? I'll highlight it. What if is your friend. It's awesome. It literally is, what if? What if I ran this command? What would happen? And sometimes you're going to get a more helpful output than others. So I ran the command. This one's saying, well, if I ran that, it's saying it's going to proceed to configure the following parameters of the virtual machine with name SEC while win, and then kind of nothing else. We know that it's going to disable feature. In a lot of cases, it'll actually tell you, I was going to do this to that, uh, but I didn't. So you can see what's going on. So you can use what if with unsafe commandlets to start learning them. They're like, what if I did this? What would actually happen? Right? And this is just kind of a very easy example. Or I can say, well, anytime I run this command, I want it to ask me, do I want to do it? So I can run the second one with confirm true, which is a Boolean just variable there. And in very small font, it's just saying, do you want to do this? And you have the choice of yes, no, yes to all, not to all, suspend. You have a lot of options. It's like the Baskin Robbins of modal boxes. So you say, well, no, I don't want to do that. If you really want to get biblical with this thing, you can actually set a variable called confirm preference. So that's a global variable. And you can just say, I want confirm to be on everything, a high level preference. I don't care what it is, how minimal it is, always ask me before you run anything. And I call this the training wheels mode. When I run a new script, I typically turn this on, 
because I'm worried that I fat fingered something or I put something in wrong. I just go ahead and run this. You just run it. You're not going to see any output because we just saved the, uh, the the value of high to this variable. And then here I'm running the command again. I'm not telling it to confirm, but it's still going to confirm because I told it globally confirm everything. Right. So put training wheels mode on when you start to learn with this stuff. Just remember to turn it off where you give it to somebody. Or they're like, why am I having to yes 300 times to this change? So question in the front. No, that's good. So how am I running the lines of code without running the whole thing? I'm hitting the F8 key on the keyboard. Yeah, you can also go to uh, debug in the menu there and just say run line. So all the little shortcuts are there. Yeah. So that's how I'm doing that. Uh, do we have another question over the side there? Yes. Yes. So we can show that here. I have conf I have the global variable set to high. And I can specifically say false. I don't. I don't want to do it. And uh, I actually don't want to do that. But that's <laughs> <laughs> that would override. <laughs> yeah. So the more specific and granular the command is, the more it's going to override global variables. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I don't care about DRS on my. Eh. Screw it. There we go. There it ran. You know. It just says all right. It's done. Uh, it's actually. There's a little percent complete. There we go. So now it actually ran and said, here's the results. Uh, one thing you'll also notice with PowerShell and PowerCLI is typically a return of nothing or almost nothing is it was all good. Right? These things aren't necessarily designed for a person to be at a console doing. It's more for I'm running a script of some sort and I want it to pass variables around. So here I said, do these things. And the return is, OK, it just gives you information on the object because something's been changed. So it's not going to say, successful, it's all good. Now you will know if you mess it up. For a couple reasons. One, the help desk calls. <laughs> but not as likely. Number two, your, your screen will be plastered with red text saying you, you borked it. You need to fix it. It's pretty, it's pretty good. Like if, you, if I were to go in and say, you know, confirm, misspell it or something like that, oops, I'll say yeah. It'll come through and potentially say I couldn't spell it. Although that one's a parameter, so it doesn't matter. But if you were like misspell the DRS automation or something like that, it's like, I don't know what that is. It's invalid. Go fix it. So it's, it's pretty. It's pretty verbose about helping you fix things. Okay. So, another question? Front. Right. That's only stays for that session, right? Unless PowerShell reopen it. Correct. Yeah. The question is on the confirm preference. Is that for the session or globally? And it's 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 for that session. If I were to close out, start a new session, it would no longer be uh, held within there. You can actually set this. Uh, there's actually ways you can say, well, I want this to be global, so I can do global colon. And now it's a global variable that's held everywhere. Because there's various scopes, global, user, machine, things like that. Uh, but generically, if you don't do it, it's for your user session. Good well, question. And so that's one of the things that you can use your PowerShell profile to do as well. So then if you set that in the profile, then it persists throughout every time the profile is run. Good point. Do we have a question over here somewhere? Yes, sir. Uh, why do, why do you so the question is, why did I do a git VM to do a set VM? It's actually. It's more personal preference how you do that. I could do a git VM and then pipe it to set VM. I could actually just pass the name to set VM. The reason in this case I want to do that was that you can, I didn't want to shorthand anything for this demo. I want to show you exactly what's going on and make it very verbose. Uh, but you could use the name, you could pipe it, or you could do it this very kind of long form way. It's up to you. And in most cases, I'd probably actually get the VM and save it as a variable somewhere in the top and then pass that to it. But again, just trying to make sure that you didn't have to read extra lines of code for this case. Good question. Okay. So I just wanted to. Oh, one more question. What about when you potentially submit a feed center and how you authenticate with the screen? Do I have to Actually, so the question is how did I conf uh, connect to vCenter and that kind of jazz? It's actually hidden up here with the ellipses. So I'm actually, uh, I just didn't want to focus on that too much, but since you have the question, we'll talk about it. So essentially, what I'm doing is uh, I'm importing a couple modules uh, manually because I want to make sure that they're in there. Uh, so whenever I work with uh, PowerCLI, I always import. The vmware.vimautomation.core, and I have the old habit of importing the VDS one too because I do so much work with the networking stuff. Uh, and then I'm then asking it for just that first time to do a git credential, and I say that to me because that's easy. Who are you? Me. I'm me. Uh, and I pass the information of my username and password, and then I'm connecting to my VI server using Connect VI Server. I pass the IP and I pass the credential because if you don't pass a credential to the command to connect to the vCenter server. 
It kind of stalls out waiting for NTLM to fail, and then it asks you for credentials. So I find it easier just to pass it credentials uh, when I actually connect. Cool. All right. Question? Right, good. good. You're good at finding the hands raised. I, I must have like old man eyes or something. <laughs> so, just real quick, I want to run through a couple things that I had written about this. This is more for when you go home and you have it on the deck, things like that. So again, safe, doesn't modify the data. Those are great places to start. I suggest learning there and learning the syntax using the safe ones. What if and confirm are your friends? They're the safeguards. Remember, uh, confirm uh, is always, it, it's great as the training mode, uh, training wheels mode. So, and what if is great for figuring out what, what's going to happen. What if is also dependent highly on how the person that wrote the code structured uh, the statements within there. There's actually places where they tell it what to say during what if. So you're going to find sometimes what if is good and sometimes it's kind of not so helpful. Uh, and here's some examples. Oh, you can see the, the modal box much bigger there. There's the Baskin one, Baskin Robbins one. Cool. And then the last thing I want to talk about are common verbs. So uh, PowerShell has a very specific format: verb dash singular noun. Like everything that you're going to write has to follow that format, or it's going to yell at you. Right? Not so much the singular noun, but definitely an approved verb dash noun. And you can use get verb to tell you what's available if you want to start writing some functions. Right, so uh, that's there. But essentially, it all makes sense, right? Git is going to get some data, new creates it, sets changes it, and remove deletes it. So if you used to CRUD type systems, it's very similar to that. Any, any thoughts to add there? Nope. Good. Cool. All right. So those are the basics. Uh, question? Yeah, so the question is: the Git credential is that uh, stored securely or plain text? It's an encrypted variable. Yeah, it's secured. Mm -hmm. So I'm the only I'm the only one that can see it with my user session. Sorry, I can't hear the question. Yeah, if you want to see it, the uh, question is, you know, basically, what, we'll just show what happens. So if I, if I just say, if you select a line of code and hit F8, it helps if I show it to you. It'll pop up and say, give me the information using the standard Windows login. You can pass it in a bunch of different ways, but the password for Git credential always has to be a secure string. Right? So you can't just pass a plain text piece of information into it. So it just asks me, hey, what is it? So, actually, I better, cool. better type it now. And so connecting to the virtual center server, you can also just pass it just username and <coughs> password parameters as well. However, you know. That sounds like a horrible idea. It, it, it is a horrible <laughs> idea. So you know, try and use credentials wherever possible. Yeah, plain text, bad. Always secure your stuff. There's lots of ways to secure information. You don't have to store plain text in memory that other people can, can mess with. Cool. So let's talk about, now that we've got just some basics, I wanted to go into, let's like write something that's useful that you can take home and hopefully you know, find some value in. Sound cool? You, you all, that's your homework, basically. You have to write this code. You could just copy it from me, but. It's like taking a coloring book someone's already finished and be like, this is mine, and put it on the fridge. <laughs> so so here, here's, here's your homework. We'll go through it live, and then I put two use cases here. So we have some questions. We're a vSphere administrator. Hopefully, we all have VMware running our environment somewhere, else why are you here? Um, what values are configured for the cluster is your question. Like, oh, how's it configured? And you don't want to go in the GUI uh, because maybe you're forced to use the web client. You know how horrible that is. Rim shot. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Every year I present at VMworld, I stick it to the web client. <laughs> and you have some type of desired state in mind for some of the values, right? So that's kind of the premise of this exercise. Um, and we're going to look at the DRS automation level. We want to make sure that's fully automated. That's probably a pretty standard setting, right? Is anyone not cool with fully automated, or at least partially automated? Unless you don't own DRS, maybe you're running the basic licensing. Uh, and make sure high availability is enabled. So these are, these are very basic stuff. So we're going to cover the DRS automation is fully automated piece. Right? So we're going to make sure that that's, that's good to go. So let's switch over. I don't, know, I don't know if you're going to lunge at me or not. What's going on? <laughs> cool. Uh, well, after that web client crack. Yeah. Ha ha. I don't work for VMware. I love it. It's awesome. <laughs> so here's, here's the completed masterpiece. Uh, but we'll, we'll go through how it's all constructed. right? So the, the thought is, whenever you're, and this is just a script. We're not running a function. I didn't want to go too crazy here. But let, let's walk through it. The first thing I like to do when I write scripts, or really anything, is uh, pull in variables. Put those at the top, 
that's the way I started writing scripts. You know, I don't, I don't do it with functions anymore, but with scripts, I think it's cool to just put everything that can be changed or modified or something you want someone else to, to play with at the top. So we have one variable. It's cluster equals the word demo. Right? So if I just run that, now cluster has a key value pair. It's cluster with the, with the value of demo. You know, no big deal. Then I want to say, OK, I want to make sure that the DRS automation level is set to fully automated. So I'm next saying, get the cluster configuration, store it. I use lower camel case for my variables, just how I was taught to do things. So that's why it looks weird. I'm getting all the cluster information for the name cluster. And that way, the, the hope is all the code below here. And we're, gonna, we're actually going to point out a mistake. And we're going to fix that in the code. Like, that's part of the, the exercise. Hopefully, the, the, the code at the bottom is, is reusable, right? So if I actually run this, I get no return, right? If I actually go here, it just says, yeah, I have information. It's stored in that variable. But if I pull up cluster config, I can see that it has information, right? All the objects are stored in that variable now. And I can actually dot source all sorts of information. So I can say, you know, what's the HA enabled state? You know, that's the value. And this is another reason that I really like the PowerShell ISE, is it has IntelliSense. And that's why when I start typing cluster config, period, this is IntelliSense. It's telling me about all these pieces that are here. It's even telling me the actual method that's being used to pull that data. So for DRS mode, there it is. We want to make sure that, that these things are there. So that's why I store that information in there. And I also put this in here just so you can see. Um, well, we did that a little bit earlier. But just so you can see what that looks like when I do the format, everything. That's just the, the vomit all the objects uh, way of doing it. Cool. Wait, I'm tabbing too quickly. I gotta wait a few seconds. Okay, there we go. So we'll move this. We'll move this away for right now. Let's just focus on this piece. So this is the logic statement, and logic is what makes scripting do stuff, makes it interesting. Right? Without logic, you're just saying, "Give me some stuff," and then you're like, "Here's some stuff." Stuff doesn't do very much. So logically, I'm saying, well, if right, everyone understands an if statement. If something is true, do something. If it's false, do something. It's, it's like yes or no. So we're just checking for true false. Here I'm saying if the DRS automation level object within the cluster config, and I'll pull that up real quick. Let's go ahead and just run that little piece. I'm just highlighting it, hitting F8. We'll switch over and see. It's set to fully automated, so it is what we want it to be. But we're going to check to make sure that it is programmatically. So if that value does not equal, that's what the NE stands for. And if I start typing, it'll give me all the different options, dash, whatever. So I want not equal. And it tells you right there, not equal to, case incentive. Uh, it's very helpful. That's why I like it. If it doesn't equal fully automated, we want to do some stuff. Now, where's the mistake? That should be a variable. Right? If I really want all this code to be reusable, I shouldn't statically define the end state of something in the code. Right? This should be up there as some type of variable. So I'm going to grab it, and we're going to put it up in our variables. And we can just say, like, DRS state or something. I don't even like that. We'll just say state. And we'll run that. Now we can reuse that state variable. And we're comparing one variable to another. It means that anyone I pass this code to can very easily go up to the top and say, well, my, de my cluster is not called demo, because hopefully you run actual stuff on yours. Mine's just like demo stuff. Mine's called production, or awesome, or SpongeBob. And my state's supposed to be partially automated, or fully automated, or whatever that may be. You can choose. So we're just comparing these two. If the automation does not equal the state of fully automated. Do these things. So you can say, you know, this is probably not the best way to do it. Just, just yell at somebody. Hey, DRS automation, it's wrong. But it's just an example like what you could do. You could warn somebody. Alternatively, yeah, I'm like, hey, you suck. There we go. Let's rewrite that. You could say, well, if it's, if it's found not to be fully automated, Warn somebody, maybe. Send an email. I don't know. Shoot a flare up. Send a carrier pigeon. Post a message to Slack. Use the IoT button to harass someone as a DM on Twitter. And then fix it. Because if I already know what I want the state to be, what's stopping me from fixing the state? If it doesn't equal the state value of fully automated, why don't I just fix that? Make sense? So I can say, we'll set the cluster DRS automation level to the state value. And if I run that, it's going to come through and say, oh, I don't have cluster information there. There we go. Boop. And it's warning me, hey, are you sure you want to do this? Well, what if I don't want it to warn me? What do I do? Any takers? Confirm fault. Man, this is amazing. It's amazing. You, you're all PowerShell masters. So I can say confirm false. 
and then it'll just do it, right? That's simple. And this is where I think the power of scripting and infrastructure code starts to really play in. You know, we're, we're writing it kind of fancy. It looks fancy. That's why it's, you know, 17 lines of code. There's a lot of white space. It's pretty straightforward. You could package this up as just one little thing and have this automated, or maybe use it with vCheck from Alan Renouf and say, well, if you find some kind of issue, go ahead and fix it. Or use DSC from Luke Deacons, uh, the vSphere DSC. But that's the kind of idea. So let's not just report on these state differences. Let's actually do something about it. So if I bring the other code back up so we can see it, we said, if it doesn't equal fully automated, do these things. Else, meaning any other r return, which in this case would be it does equal fully automated, we can say everything is groovy, which also isn't very helpful, but let's run that. So I'm going to hit F5, which will run the entire thing. And it says everything is groovy. There we go. Gravy. That's what I said. Totally. Just making sure you're paying attention. I already commented about my bad eyes. Apparently, even in front. Everything is gravy. Biscuit wheels. Yeah, it should be a variable. The actual state of the of the graviness, right? And it could be that it sends an email or puts some information in InfluxDB so you can report on it. But that's the simplicity, I think, of PowerShell. I think that's the the power, pun not intended, of PowerShell, is that you can write these very. I mean, this this is all. It's all pretty plain English, right? It's not. It's something you can just kind of look at and say, oh, I can do that. It's easy to, to copy. And if you had a question, you know, somebody would be able to look at your code pretty straightforward. Okay, so I'll switch back over. Oh, question? Yes, sir? So the question is essentially, couldn't I just flip that around and make sure, you know, basically the logic could be done a different way. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so it really boils down to overhead, you know, would it be faster to do it a different way, check to make sure if it's, uh, if it does equal fully automated, and if it doesn't, then do things. You could do a measure command to figure out if there is any kind of latency on that. Realistically, once we pull that config data in, a simple loop like this, a simple if-then-else kind of statement, is I don't think you're going to retrieve any major speed gains there. But it's certainly good to, you know, if you, for me, it's if you ran it and you noticed it wasn't performing like you want, then I would dig into it a little bit. For some reason, the way I like I write code is I always want to, I always like to make sure that something is not what I want it to be first, just to make because there's infinite possibilities that it might be, right? Someone might have set it somehow to the word banana, and I might not be looking for that. I don't know. So I tend to go kind of on the negative to to find is it, is it anything but what I want, and if it is something's busted, I want to fix it. So that, that's probably 95% of of coding work is uh, handling uh, people and the weird inputs they give you. That's a good question. Any other questions? So that's that's that particular setting. Do we want to look at like the high availability settings too, or did you want that as your homework? Because we could. You want to do it on your own? You want gold star? If you like post a picture on Twitter, I'll like it or something. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I talked about this. The other thing I want to point out was um, something I really like to do. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you a little bit here. Is actually if you start using the ISE, especially with uh, uh, the the PowerShell ISE with ISC steroids as an example, you can start interrogating all these values beyond just formatting lists and things like that. So I want to show you that, show you the power of uh, extending the, the ice. So if I hit this little button that's probably hard to see, it looks like a dollar sign little button there. It's actually going to tell me all the variable information. I don't think I can make that bigger. But essentially, I can go to the cluster config and expand that. And it gives me this nice, you know, I can't, can't read the text, but it's a hierarchy of every piece of information that's in there. So if you're looking for something, and you're not quite sure where it is, you can explore and you can go down further. You can keep going down the rabbit hole. So we talked about the high availability mode. There's a value there called HA enabled, and it's set to true. Right? So if we were to code for that, it'd basically be the same process. We're going to look at that particular, you know, cluster config dot HA enabled. Is it true? Or is it anything but true, depending on how you like to code? 
and then we'd fix that based on the value or not, right? So that's a really nice add there. Question. Go. How did you get that to come up? How did I get that to come up? That I did. So the question: How did I get that to come up? I did two things. One, I have ISE steroids, which is an extension for PowerShell ISE, and two, I hit the little red variable button that opens a window pane on the side. That's pretty much it. There's another nice feature that I like about this. Uh, it's refactoring the code. So actually, there's a bunch of rules built into ISE steroids where I can say, you know, fix the script now. And what it's going to do is reorganize all of the code so that it meets the standards of writing PowerShell code. So even if you don't know what you're doing, you can use this, and you have amazing code now. So see how it's made it all pretty. It's organized. It's actually requiring versions of, of modules and things like that up there. I think that's a great way to get started with PowerShell. Do you use ISE steroids? Yep. Yeah. I love ISE steroids. Both great utility. Both big fans. I have some backup slides here in case the demo didn't work, and thank God the thing did. A couple things, Kyle, want to tell them about uh, resources on the web? Sure. So there is a very cool poster that was published here in probably the last couple months. It's the Complete Guide to PowerShell Punctuation. So it goes through, it gives you the difference between double quotes, single quotes, uh, you know, in pretty much everything that's available out there. Uh, so that's a really great resource to have, uh, especially as you're learning and, and getting... Uh, yeah, used to, to PowerShell and creating your own stuff. Uh, and then brand new as of today, there's also the PowerCLI 6.3 reference one, or uh, R1 reference poster. Uh, that's out there on vmware.com slash go slash posters. So it's been a little while since we've had an updated poster. I think it was like 5.8. Uh, so that's a, a new version that's out there. You can get that today. Cool. And if there's any other questions, we'll take them now. I'll pause for a moment to see if there are. Question? Uh, Onyx? Yes. Onyx, yeah. Can it take uh, an existing environment and create the CLI to replicate it? Can you take an existing environment and use the CLI to replicate it? There's a certain amount of work that would go involved, uh, that would be involved with that, but you could grab all the data out of there and then use the appropriate creation commands to use that as data in the future, yeah. Yeah, so what, what Onyx is going to do is it's going to follow you as you're in the GUI and print out the code that you could then replicate it at a later point in time. So, so you know, if you log into Onyx and you start setting up your environment, if you ever had to go back and repeat that, Onyx already has that. Uh, you know, as long as you, you know, grab all of that code while you're still logged into that session. Yeah. Question? Yeah, so the, uh, the VMCN, the oh, sorry. Uh, the, the question was about getting access to the community uh, as far as the PowerCLI community and what resources are available there. So there's the VMTN community forums. That's on VMware.com itself. Uh, there is also the uh, VMware code. That's a new uh, resource that's out there. There's a Slack channel uh, that you can go through as well. Uh, and then on GitHub, uh, specific to VMware's GitHub repository, there's a PowerShell or PowerCLI.script examples, and that's all community source stuff. Another question over there? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Question? Uh, sorry, yes. Uh, Power, uh, PowerCLI command list for SRM. Uh, there are plans, ETAs, I, unfortunately, I don't know. It's, Soon. It's, yeah, it, it's a work in progress. It's, yeah. it, you know, most people also ask about Horizon. That's another work in progress that, you know, if you've used it today, it's, it's not necessarily the cleanest or the nicest, but, uh, uh, you know, the, that feedback has been received, and we're certainly working on it. Well, I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, I saw your hand up first. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, tips, tips for source control. Uh, definitely use Git, GitHub. It's actually, they support PowerShell natively. Uh, there's a Windows installer for GitHub as well. It's the Windows, uh, the GitHub desktop, which actually includes a, I'll show you real quick. It actually includes a couple really cool tools. So if I go to the Git shell that gets installed with uh, the GitHub for desktop, and ignore the red crap there. And if I go to like one of my Vester projects example, you can see it's, it's uh, oof, 
I don't know how to make that bigger off the, off the cuff, but essentially it's full GitHub support, and, I'm sorry, Git support for local and porting into GitHub. So you can do, you know, Git log, all that kind of stuff, it's all there. So really great way to do PowerShell, especially because it's all text files, basically. So you can, you can work with a lot of projects on GitHub. So can't say good enough, about, good, uh, enough good things about that. And it's free. And you also have the, if you do want to go the paid version, you can make your repositories private as well. Yeah. So great resource. All right, that's the time we have. What's that? GitLab. GitLab. That's another free alternative. Or Bitbucket is another one as well that's free. So that's the time we have. Thank you very much for coming out. I think we'll be hanging around for a bit for any questions, but appreciate it. <laughs>